Fletcher for Upper GI. So I am sharing my screen with all of you and uh, we will hold questions until the end. I'm gonna pull up two PowerPoints, the one that I made and then one out of the book. And I'll have those both modified probably a little bit and then uploaded back onto Teams when this lecture is done. All right, so with the first PowerPoint, uh, that is right here. So this is upper GI. Um, we're gonna focus in on anorexia, loss of appetite, nausea and vomiting, and GERD. Um, you definitely will have questions about GERD. That's, they love, the Board of Nursing and ATI loves to ask about it. So what is anorexia? Don't confuse it with anorexia nervosa. That is a psychological disorder. Anorexia itself just means loss of appetite. It's a symptom, really, of lots of diseases. Um, it has to do with sometimes medications, uh, certain meds like chemotherapy for cancer, um, radiation therapy, even though that's not a medication, but it's a treatment for cancer, can have people lose their appetite. Uh, what are the things that we need to look at for a patient with anorexia? We have to make sure that their nursing care is what it needs to be. In other words, we're monitoring their intake and their output. How much are they taking in? Food, fluid, et cetera. Vital signs, electrolytes. Especially for people that are elderly. Remember, I always tell you, very old, very young. They are very fragile. And so for you or I, if we had one day where we didn't feel well, maybe, you know, upset stomach, GI distress, loss of appetite, it wouldn't be that big a deal. But for someone elderly, they could go into an electrolyte imbalance within a matter of hours. It doesn't take much, so it's critical. Uh, we know that potassium is the queen mother, right? And so for anybody that's got a potassium imbalance, remember this, potassium high or potassium low. The first nursing intervention, get that patient on an EKG because potassium, when you think potassium, you think muscle. And the myocardium, that's what makes your heart beat. That's a muscle. Potassium, either high or low, will affect the rhythm of the heart, and it can cause fatal dysrhythmias. So that's critical for you to remember. Potassium, hyperhypokalemia, first nursing intervention, get that patient on an EKG, then call the doctor. If their potassium is high, by the way, there is a medication that we can give them to draw some of the potassium out of their body. And it's one of the med templates that y'all were supposed to do, k -exalate. And if you notice, potassium is identified as a capital K with a plus sign, right? And then k -exalate. get it? So k -exalate can be given uh, by mouth or it can even be given rectally. Osmotically, it will draw potassium through the membrane of the intestines and the patient will wind up poop out the potassium. So don't forget that, okay, if their potassium is too high. Um, when we talk about nausea and vomiting, just make sure that you understand nausea is the urge to vomit, feeling nauseous. By the way, not nauseated, nauseous, okay? And then vomiting is the actual act of the food or whatever's in your stomach coming out, being expelled, sometimes violently, through your esophagus and your mouth. Um, for anybody that's ever thrown up before, and I'm thinking everybody has at least once in their life, it burns. Why? Because the acid that's in your stomach is also being forced up through the esophagus. And the esophageal lining is a smooth mucosal membrane. And it's not meant to be exposed to that type of hydrochloric acid that's in your stomach. So you'll feel this burning feeling, okay? What makes people vomit? Well, bacterial infections can do it. Viral infections, I think everyone's heard of the rotovirus. Rotovirus is just what we commonly call the stomach bug. Um, don't call it the stomach flu. Very confusing for people. It's not a flu. Um, it's the rotovirus. Pregnancy. Oftentimes, um, the beginning, the first trimester of pregnancy, um, there can be a hyperemesis. If the vomiting continues beyond the first trimester, or if it's so significant that there's a loss of weight, 
hyperemesis gravidarum, um, then that needs um, nursing and, and medical intervention, obviously. But just, you know, some morning sickness, we call it, is typical with pregnancy, usually in the first trimester because of hormonal changes. Food poisoning. Your body's actually trying to help you out. If you eat something that you should not have eaten, two things will happen. One, if the acid in your stomach is not sufficient to destroy it, because that's part of the reason why there's hydrochloric acid in your stomach. It not only helps break down the food into a very mushy pureed-like substance called chyme, but because it's acid, it actually has the potential to be a defense mechanism for your immune system. In other words, it can kill a lot of things like bacteria, certain bacteria, certain viruses that can reside in your stomach coming in through the food that you ate. But not all of them are impervious to that acid. So sometimes you'll eat something and usually uh, seafood tends to be the biggest culprit. And a few hours later, you start feeling that sweaty, diaphoretic feeling. Um, I know that if I'm going to vomit, I feel like my tongue is starting to sweat. You start to salivate. Your body says, nope, we can't take this. It's bad. Get rid of it. And you will vomit. Okay. And then medications can make you vomit. Um, medications used for emesis. And the one that I gave you guys was Ondansetron, which is Zofran. Antiemetic. It can be given by mouth. It can be given by mouth, but an orally disintegrating tablet, which is the best invention ever in the world. Just place it in the patient's mouth and literally when it hits their tongue, it'll just disintegrate and get absorbed into the oral mucosa and subsequently into the bloodstream. It's fast acting. Can be given um, intravenously as well. Um, if the patient is complaining of nausea or if the patient is actively vomiting, pretty please don't give them anything by mouth because they're just going to throw that medicine right back up. You're going to find an alternate route. Okay. Um, side effects I put on there, you know, for central nervous system, headache, dizziness, drowsiness, fatigue, weakness. Don't worry about torsade de points for cardiovascular system. You don't need to know that one, but, um, QT interval prolongation. Uh, I'm going to have to talk to you guys, uh, in a little short separate lecture, uh, about cardiac rhythms. Um, the board is now asking a few questions about EKG, not many, but I'll get you guys up to speed so that you'll understand what that means. Constipation, diarrhea, you can read, okay? And make sure you guys all should know what extra pyramidal reactions are. EPS, those fun things that can happen with certain antipsychotic medications that cause an ataxic gait, which is that shuffling, awkward gait, um, awkward involuntary movements of the body in general, which are akathesias. Um, and then oculogyric crisis, it's a fun word, awkward involuntary movements of the eyes, mouth, or tongue, smacking, blah, 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 blah. tardive dyskinesia, that's part of EPS. Okay, so those are all EPS extrapyramidal reactions. Make sure that you know those when it comes to Zofran. All right. Obesity and malnutrition. Um, why is that important? It's important for so many different reasons. Um, if someone is obese, and obesity means that they're greater than 20% of their ideal body weight for their body type and height, okay? So bad for your joints, very bad for your cardiovascular system. Um, carrying around that extra weight is a strain on your body in general. And then on the other end of the spectrum, malnutrition, well, that's just as big a problem for other reasons. Um, if people are not getting sufficient nutrition that includes, you need protein, heme, and non-heme. You need carbohydrates, the good ones, not the bad ones. And remember, the complex carbs are the good ones, and the simple carbs are the bad ones. And just remember my line, if it's white, it ain't right. If it's brown, I'm down. So your complex carbs are your things that are brown, like brown rice, sweet potatoes, um, whole grain pastas, things like that, wheat bread, rye bread, multi-grain bread. Those are the good things. The, they're the complex carbs. You need vitamins and minerals for various reasons, obviously. 
Um, but you need to get all this and even a little bit of fat. You need some lipids. Do the food you eat for people that, uh, example, elderly people on fixed incomes. I mean, I have seen patients that cannot afford both their rent and food along with the medications that they take, which is sad and should never happen in this country. But clearly, none of us knows how government works anymore. Anyway, um, so I've seen patients. I had a woman that was eating cat food, canned cat food, heartbreaking. And that's a big problem because cat food has a lot of protein in it. Make sure you're muted. So cat food has a lot of protein in it and we need some protein, but not that much. And so they can actually put themselves into almost like a fetal ketonuria, PKU, which when we get to maternal newborn, because I'm going to be doing a lecture on that too, we'll talk about that. Um, so morbid obesity means that the person's BMI is greater than 40 and you need to know that number. ATI will ask. Board of Nursing may ask. Malnutrition means the patient has a BMI less than 17.5. Um, and that's also a criteria for admission to hospice, by the way. So if you have a BMI less than 17.5, you could be a hospice patient. Um, ATI, the comp predictor, a couple of the versions have a question about body mass index calculation or about, you know, they're giving you a scenario with the patient has a BMI of such and such. And, you know, is it, is it normal? Is it too high? Is it too low? So I've included a little chart here on body mass index. So you can kind of see what is in the normal range or desirable range, what's considered overweight and then what's considered obese. When I use the term morbid obesity, morbidity means a risk for great harm. Mortality would be death, right? So morbid obesity means that the patient is so obese that they are now at a risk for grave and profound harm to their homeostatic state. Okay, you need to know that. Um, oral health, I can't say this enough. Um, you need to have good, healthy teeth, gums, oral mucosa. If you have a patient that's either missing teeth or they don't have any teeth, by the way, the term is edentulous, don't have any teeth. Um, they have dentures that don't fit them properly. That's a big problem. Um, if they don't fit right, they hurt. And if they hurt, the patient won't wear them. If the patient doesn't wear them, nutrition is going to be compromised. They're not going to be eating the way they should. Um, or they're going to be eating just soft foods, things that they are able to chew or gum, I should say, without their teeth. So, you know, oral health is important, even from a cardiac perspective, okay? And, and we'll review cardiac later, but just remember, oral health is important. Um, when you assess the patient's mouth, you're assessing for teeth, presence of teeth, condition of teeth, um, you're assessing the oral mucosa, they should be pink and moist. If they're gray or dusky, that means possibly anemia. If they're dry, and possibly dehydration. So very important to look in someone's mouth. Okay, now we're gonna talk about GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So when we look at GI anatomy, upper gastrointestinal system anatomy, you have your mouth, you have your epiglottis, pharynx, esophagus, and at the very bottom of the esophagus where it meets the stomach, is the LES, and that's the lower esophageal sphincter. And that is, just like everything else in our bodies, it is a one-way street, right? One-way valve. Only thing it's supposed to do is open to allow food and drink to go through into the stomach, and then it's supposed to, bam, slam shut, okay? The reason it's gotta keep that acid in the stomach, because that's the only place it belongs. Um, and I think I mentioned this before, but if I didn't, I'll tell you now. The acid in your stomach, it's hydrochloric acid. It is the strongest, most potent type of acid that there is. Um, if you wanna get rid of a dead body, just I'm just saying, if you needed to for whatever reason, if I could take the hydrochloric acid out of my stomach and just a couple of you guys and put it into like a big vat, 
that would dissolve the bones, the teeth, and everything else. Bye. Anyway, just a fun fact. So when people have GERD, that lower esophageal sphincter isn't working right for lots of different reasons. So obesity is one reason because if there's excess belly fat and it's pushing on the stomach, it's pushing on the stomach, which is kind of forcing that sphincter up and open. And then it's causing that hydrochloric acid to like work its way back up the esophagus since that burning feeling that you get in your throat. Um, pregnancy, especially late pregnancy, the last trimester. Those of you that have kids, you if you remember, I mean, my youngest is 30 and I still remember. Those last like eight weeks are a mess because you're just oh, huge. And all that baby is pushing on the stomach, same thing, just like with obesity, pushing that esophageal sphincter open, pushing that acid back up the esophagus and it burns. With obesity and with pregnancy, those two conditions, while well, pregnancy ends um, and obesity, you can lose weight. So it would resolve the problem, right? So you wouldn't have the GERD anymore. Um, but for some people, the GERD happens for other reasons. Sometimes it's idiopathic and idiopathic etiology means, I don't know what caused it. It's just, it just is. Um, for some people where it is idiopathic, um, there is a surgical procedure. It is in your book. If you wanted to read about it, I don't talk about it. No, the board of nursing ATI does not ask about it. And it's really not that successful. It's only been around for about five or six years. Um, but just FYI, um, nursing interventions, and this is the part you need to understand. What are you going to teach the patient with GERD? So spicy food is a no, no, okay. Cause it exacerbates it. Um, smoking, unlike what I always think, these do not have vitamins and minerals in them. Well, they do for me, but not for other people. Smoking will exacerbate it. Drinking alcohol will exacerbate GERD. Um, when the patient eats a meal, and this one's important, ATI question, remember, and board of nursing, you always instruct the patient to never lie down immediately after a meal. So, they need to be in an upright position after their last meal of the day for at least two hours. Two hours, remember that, that's important, okay? Um, the best scenario would be that the head of their bed be elevated. Um, my mother had GERD when she was older, she was in her 80s, and back then there were no craftmatic adjustable beds that you could bring home, plus we didn't have the money for it anyway. But we took two by fours, and elevated the head of the bed for her so that she was never really lying flat and then some additional pillows, okay? Um, if you see a question where it talks about, you know, you have a patient that's diagnosed with GERD, which of the following, you know, instructions should be included in the nursing plan of care? If it says something about a bedtime snack, nope, right? Okay, because they shouldn't eat anything right before they lie down. Makes it worse. All right, so that is, let's see, that's GERD. And then what medications do we use? Medications that you need to know. Histamine receptor agonists, um, H2 receptor agonists. These are the common ones you can get them over the counter. Um, and they're also by prescription. Ranitidine, famotidine, cimetidine. Um, I put on this PowerPoint exactly what they do action-wise. Don't worry about it. They actually suppress the secretion of the acid, right? So they don't just neutralize it. They actually suppress secretion of it. But they have some side effects, decreased libido or impotence. Um, in other words, decreased libido for men and women. Not much interest in the banging, knocking boots. Um, for men, they might not be able to get an erection. And that's never a good thing for any man. I don't care if he's eight or 90. But the big thing you need to remember, especially with cimetidine, okay? If you have a patient that has any cognitive impairment, if they have Alzheimer's, any form of dementia for that matter, you do not want them to receive cimetidine because it has been shown to increase confusion in the elderly. Remember that one. That's a question too.
You're welcome. Okay. Um, the other medication that we use are PPIs, with proton pump inhibitors. Um, don't confuse these guys with antifungals. Sometimes the classifications of drugs have commonalities in their names. Sometimes they don't. But if you see like omeprazole, lansoprazole, isomeprazole, pantoprazole, they all end in Z-O-L-E. But then again, ketoconazole, sorry, that ends in it. Um, or antifungal, rather, myconazole, antifungal, they end in Z-O-L-E also. So these you're just going to have to kind of remember on your own. Um, proton pump inhibitors actually um, do the same, kind of the same thing as the H2s do. They, they stop you from making the acid, okay? But they're only meant to be on, um, on a patient's MAR for short term. You're not supposed to be on them indefinitely or forever, although you will see them used that way. Uh, the big thing with the PPIs, dizziness, drowsiness, fatigue, um, they have been linked to cardiovascular events with long-term use, and that's important. Um, so just remember that they can cause um, more acid regurge for some people. It's a um, idiosyncratic effect, if you remember that from farm. So in other words, instead of suppressing the production of the acid, it actually can make it worse. So uh, and you can read the rest of those things that are important as far as side effects for the PPIs. And then last but not least, these are the over-the-counters, you know, like your Tums, Rolaids, Mylanta, Maalox, they're calcium carbonate. And what they do is they don't stop anything from happening. The acids in the stomach, you chew on them or you drink them, they go into the stomach and they just immediately neutralize the acid because they're an alkaline, okay? So they're quick acting, they're over the counter, but if you notice, calcium is the main ingredient, which can be good for some people, but if you don't follow the directions for use and for many, many people with chronic GERD, they'll be popping, you know, Tums or Rolaids like they're Tic Tacs. They can wind up with calcium problems. So hypercalcemia, remember, when you think potassium, you think muscle. When you think calcium and magnesium, you think nerves. When I say calcium, don't think bones, because I'm talking about calcium in your blood. Serum calcium and serum magnesium directly affect your nervous system. So potassium, muscle. Calcium and magnesium, nerves. Remember that. That's critically important, okay? And with hypercalcemia, um, the problem would be uh, diminished reflexes, okay? Diminished nerve excitation. Um, and just think about what you learned in maternity when we have a patient with eclampsia that's having seizures. We give them magnesium, Sulfate, mag, magnesium, right? Nervous system. So there's over excitation of the nervous system causing seizures. Magnesium stops that from happening. Too much mag, and then we slow down the nervous system too much. So we give calcium gluconate as the antidote to kind of reverse the effect of the magnesium. So calcium, magnesium, nervous system. Okay, remember that. Okay, next we have peptic ulcer disease. This is a fun one. I put a little picture here. The word ulcer or ulceration means an erosion away of something. So with a peptic ulcer, we're talking about an erosion or a wearing away of the lining of the stomach, which those are gastric ulcers, or the duodenum. And when we talk about the small intestine, just remember, you know, when we go through the digestive system, the mouth, the epiglottis, the pharynx, the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter, the stomach, the pyloric sphincter, and the small intestine, which is DJ ileum. That's how you remember the small intestine. Duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. 
right? They're the three parts, about 20 feet in length total. And then from the ilium, we go to the large intestine, also known as the colon. And you've got the ascending, the transverse, and the descending colon to the rectum and ending in Uranus. And that makes me laugh every time. Okay, so ulcers, peptic ulcers, erosions in the lining of the stomach or the duodenum. The most common cause we have found of all ulcers in the digestive tract are due to H. pylori. Helicobacter pylori, that is a particular type of bacteria. Um, it absolutely causes ulcerations and it can be diagnosed with a simple breath test. Uh, some of the other reasons for peptic ulcers, long-term use of aspirin, which can wear away at the lining of that um, small intestine or stomach. NSAIDs also can do that. Stress and spicy foods don't cause them, but they make them worse. Cigarette smoking will make them worse. Alcohol can cause them and make them worse. Okay? There's, there's nothing good in alcohol. So, you know, anyway. So, what do we do with peptic ulcer disease? Remember this. TI question, right? Contradictor. Somebody diagnosed with H. pylori, the most common and very, very super effective treatment is a combination of a proton pump inhibitor, and it's usually omeprazole, which is Prilosec, along with an antibiotic, and it's usually either amoxicillin or clarithromycin, okay? So that is kind of a synopsis of what you need to know about the upper GI system. I am going to stop this recording right now and open up for questions.